Welcome everyone to the first lecture of this year's Spotlight Lecture Series. Uh, tonight we'll hear a talk from Bristol alumni and chartered engineer James Foreman. Before that begins, I'd like to introduce myself and talk very briefly about some of our upcoming events. I'm Gabriel Littler, I'm the president of EWB Bristol and I'm looking forward to meeting some of you and some of our new members. Uh, as you know, this is the first lecture of our Spotlight Lecture Series uh, and the le next lecture will be two weeks from now with details to be announced across our usual channels. Uh, we're also beginning orders for our fleeces, which this year will be made of 100% recycled material. And finally, sign up for families will be in our next newsletter. So if you'd like to get involved, fill out the form in the next email. Uh, as you, some of you know, anyway, uh, we usually give out pizza at these lectures, but since times have changed, we've decided that we'll be giving out a pizza to whoever asks the most interesting and insightful question in the Q&A section at the end. So get your thinking caps on and think of something interesting to ask. Uh, until then, I'll hand over to our speaker for tonight, James Foreman. James? Yeah, so I am a civil engineer. I'm chartered with the ICE. Uh, as mentioned, I actually went to Bristol University, uh, graduating in 2011. And at the moment, I work for Atkins in Bristol as a senior civil engineer. Uh, so yeah, with Engineers Without Borders. I did this placement in Rwanda in 2016. Um, and since then I've been what's known as their partnership coordinator for the built environment. So um, I work with any of our partner organizations who are in the civil structural engineering sector, uh, providing support to them through EWB. So a bit of history on the organization. So EWB UK, we are galvanizing uh, the engineering community to serve all people and the planet better than ever before by inspiring, uh, enabling and influencing the engineering community. We're encouraging a more globally responsible engineering practice. And what I've got here is a few images which kind of represent the diversity of, of the events that uh, we get involved in as an organization. Um, there's events with undergraduate students, um, such as yourselves. So this one, in fact, which can you see? Can you see my mouse now? Um, this image on the bottom right is, I believe, from our design challenge. This shows one of the undergraduates uh, kind of uh, explaining and defending her, her project to the judges. Um, there's different pictures which show how we interact with the younger children in schools, kind of promoting the study of, of STEM subjects. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and maths, um, and images that kind of show how industry professionals, such as myself, uh, how we get involved. So EWB as well ho hosts a number of uh, discussion panels um, that are free to attend, and you can come and watch and participate and ask questions on, on kind of topics relevant to uh, sustainable engineering. Globally responsible engineering is the uh, phrase they like to use. Um, so this is a bit of history on the organisation, which started over 15 years ago for EWB UK. Now, Engineers Without Borders exists in over 60 countries around the world, and it started out in the 1980s uh, to help provide engineering support to Ethiopia, um, who were suffering with famine at that period. And the UK branch of Engineers Without Borders started in 2001 at Cambridge University. Um, and initially there was a lot of growth and within the first two years, over 20 different student chapters had been set up across the UK. Um, the organisation then registered as a charity in 2004 and the first international placements started in 2002 to India. Um, and between 2002 and 2019, there was over 200,000 200, hours of pro bono engineering completed by EWB UK volunteers, which equates to over 150 volunteers uh, different projects around the world. And the phrase they use is, is pro bono. Uh, I don't know if, if people have heard that before. It's, it's Latin and it basically means um, services not charged for. And that's kind of to illustrate the point that these, the volunteers who go out are highly skilled. And, you know, we're, we're professionals um, who generally charge for this kind of work, but through ED, EWB, we're providing those services for free to um, valuable projects. 
so continuing through the timeline, um, in 2008, the organization got its first full-time staff member. And there was a bit more strategic thinking uh, about how the organization could get involved in research and education. And then in 2011, they launched the Design Challenge Awards, which I'll talk about uh, later on, when they were looking for ways to impact the engineering curriculum. Uh, so getting more towards the present day, uh, in 2016, there was a new strategy launched, which was a bit of a reset button for the organization uh, to rebalance the resources uh, and look at the, the best way for the organization to be sustainable going into the future. So at this point, uh, there was actually a decision made to start to pause the international placement scheme. So um, there haven't actually been any more international placements since 2019 at the moment. Um, but I'll come, I'll say more about that later on. Um, so over the last 15 years, EW, EWB UK has supported partners throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Together, we've achieved a lot, increasing access to clean water, improved sanitation facilities, reliable energy resources, and resilient built environments. So while the organization has been um, looking at its aims, over the last nine months, EWB have been researching and compiling lessons learned over their 15 year journey. Um, and there, there will be a report coming out, which is going to be shared with, with everyone, with the public, with yourselves, um, quite soon in the coming months. And the purpose of this is to reflect on the origin of the organisation, um, where it is on the, in the present, and to generate some dialogue about the future direction and strategy of the organisation. And that will be a chance for yourselves, uh, for example, to get involved in these discussions and try and help shape the direction the organisation is going in. Uh, so there's an image here kind of showing some of the changes the organisation has been through over the last 15 years. Um, evolving and growing to adapt as the challenges facing the engineering sector change. Um, as mentioned, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get involved. So if you're not already, please sign up to the mailing list of the Engineer, Engineers Without Borders uh, and you'll find out more about different ways to get involved and opportunities to help shape the strategy in the future. So now I've, I've got a quote from Katie, who's the Chief Executive of EWB UK, which I'll just read out. So we've achieved a lot, a lot, but not enough. We've inspired lots of people to reconsider what it means to be an engineer. And that's something that we're really proud of. We have no planet B and time is running out. The engineering community has an enormous role to play in addressing this challenge. It currently isn't moving fast enough and in many cases isn't ready to tackle this challenge at all. We're building a movement to tackle this. That kind of summarizes what we're trying to achieve as an organization. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a bit more specifically about the International Placement Scheme. So as I've mentioned, the scheme is currently on hold um, since last year, while the organisation is, is trying to reformulate its strategy and, and think about how best to achieve its objectives. Um, but you know, that it's not doesn't mean it's gone forever and there will be a chance to, to get involved in these kind of discussions. So, um, you know, it's something that might come back in the future. So for myself, uh, yeah, I was in the 2016 placement scheme. So this photo is a photo from, uh, we did a three day, three day training course for all the volunteers who were going out that year. So that's, that's me up there. But yeah, there was quite a lot of us, um, loads of different people going to different projects around the world. And it was a really great few days to spend together. Um, this was at the EWB headquarters in, in Vauxhall up in London. Um, and they put on yeah, you know, a set of uh, uh, training courses looking at cultural sensitivity and uh, you know, engineering uh, in the developing context. It was really valuable. Uh, so after I'd you know, been selected and done the training, uh, I went to Kigali, which is the capital city of Rwanda. And I was there for the kind of final three or four months of 2016. 
So I went to work with a company called Mass Design Group, and they are a non-profit architecture firm uh, who take on socially important projects uh, internationally with a big focus on East Africa. And they tend to work in the education, healthcare and justice markets. Uh, so that word justice was new to me, but what that means is um, memorials and statues and those kind of projects. They would design those and we'd do the engineering for those. Um, so Mass, you know, they're, as an organisation, they aim for all projects to emphasise the importance of considering long-term user needs, uh, sustainability, looking at capacity building of the local community. So through the project, giving the community skills that they can um, retain and use in the future. And also looking at maximising the use of local resources and skills in the project. Uh, the skills and resources that exist already in that area. So I'm going to give a few examples of some projects they've uh, delivered. So uh, Geskio Cholera Treatment Centre in Haiti. I was, I was struggling. I was, I've tried several times practicing to say that word. Uh, I keep getting it right. Haiti. Haiti. Haiti sounds better. Um, so back in 2010, there was an earthquake and flooding, um, which and actually that led to a cholera outbreak due, due to the poor sanitation because uh, there was kind of water and flooding everywhere. Um, so Mass got involved in, in helping deliver a medical centre to deal with uh, the cholera patients. So what they did was they went, went out to the community uh, before designing the project and did some research on um, what kind of skills existed. Uh, and what they found was that there was loads of really highly skilled metal workers in the area. So they incorporated that to the design. And what you'll see in the, um, you see the, the building is, the cladding is these uh, steel plates, which are perforated with uh, lots of holes. Um, and these were basically all hand crafted by the local uh, craftsmen in the nearby workshops. Um, and it was designed um, to maximize on the principles of, of using passive natural ventilation. Um, you know, that was an engineered design looking at how airflows worked with these perforated walls and, and that was a nice low-tech solution that helped ensure a really clean atmosphere um, and fresh air inside the building which helped protect the safety of the patients and the staff working inside. The next project I'm going to talk about uh, the maternity waiting village in Malawi. So I looked up some stats uh, just this afternoon um, before before coming on here. So in the UK, for every 10,000 women uh, who give birth, around one woman um, will die on average of those 10,000 in the UK. In Malawi in 2010, for every 10,000 women who give birth, um, on average around 278 would die. Uh, so that's a pretty horrifying statistic. So there was a... Um, a kind of program put into place in Malawi to, to develop these maternity waiting villages. And the aim of that was that um, the majority of the women who were dying in childbirth uh, were dying because they lived in very remote rural areas with, with no healthcare um, and they were dying of entirely preventable causes. So the strategy was to build these maternity waiting villages, which would be uh, like a regional hub um, and in the final weeks of pregnancy, uh, women would, would travel here and stay here for a few weeks uh, before and after childbirth, just as somewhere safe and clean um, where they could deliver their child safely. Um, and also provided a nice you know, community of, of new mothers who could um, you know, bond and, and share tips and everything. Um, so it was just to just create, Mass's involvement was to create a desirable, uh, place where these women would, would want to travel to, would enjoy their time there, uh, and that had really positive outcomes in terms of uh, protecting the health of those women. Uh, this project is called the Diane Fossey Gorilla Research Fund Campus, that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, in Rwanda. So Rwanda is one of few countries in the world where they still have wild gorillas, um, and this was a kind of really remote project close to the jungle 
to to build a, a research area for that uh, and because it's so far away from you know uh, other cities it's not connected up to any sewage networks or anything like that um, so for this project they came up with um, the use of a constructed engineered wetland uh, which uses natural processes to treat wastewater and sewage uh, coming from the coming from the site as part of their sanitation strategy so by using uh, selective vegetation um, they can engineer that area and that allows safe disposal safe disposal of the sewage uh, without the need for more extensive uh, infrastructure provision now uh, they've also used similar mass have also used similar schemes on healthcare projects um, where you know where there's not appropriate sanitation available and that helps to minimize the threat of spread of contagious disease um, due to poor sanitation by using low-tech natural solutions um, also more generally mass have got involved in helping kind of develop best practice guidance for, for the construction of hospitals and healthcare buildings um, using low-tech solutions. So uh, yeah, Engineers Without Borders UK have had quite a long-standing partnership with Mass Design Group. We've had uh, eight engineers go out there since 2013. And actually the majority of uh, those volunteers have gone on to, at the end of their placement, stay uh, stay with Mass and become paid staff um, and they're still out there now, many of them in Rwanda. Um, and one of those people is Rosie Goldrick. Uh, Rosie was there when I was there four years ago. She's still there and she's currently there, a director of engineering. Uh, she uh, was very successful last year and was the winner of the Royal Academy of Engineering McFarlane Medal, uh, which is basically awarded to the best engineer under 30 years old um, so it was a uh, huge, huge success there for Rosie and I think that's kind of testament to some of the fantastic and unique experiences you can get on projects with Engineers Without Borders. Um, so now I was going to talk a bit more specifically about some of the projects I personally got involved with uh, while I was out there. So this was the uh, a library for the African Rural University for Women in Uganda, which is just uh, north of Rwanda. And on this project, I designed a few things as the structural engineer. Um, I designed all of the foundation system and also looking at the roof. Uh, the roof was made of timber. So uh, on that project, I, I built a structural analysis model using robot software to complete that work. Um, but also I was working with one of their local engineers, uh, a Rwandan guy, who was able to provide all the advice, um, information on, on materials that were available for the design. Uh, and which was really invaluable because if you're designing in timber in the UK, for example, it's, it's quite straightforward to go to design guidance. You look up what material you want to specify and you can get it supplied. Um, which is not the case in in a, in a country such as Rwanda. So we had to be really aware of, of what materials we could source to start with and then design using those. And then we also had to be quite careful thinking about, uh, you know, what were we actually buying and what was going to be the quality of the product that we received. Um, so we actually got to visit the supplier and go and look at how they were preserving their timber and how they were storing it. And make sure that you know met our expectations and we actually took some samples away uh, where we conducted kind of independent testing just to verify the the parameters like the strength of the um, of the timber so that we could use that in our design uh, so that was all quite interesting um, another project i got involved in was uh, the early stages of design for quite a large hospital which was going to be in Kigali with 120 beds um, and at that point I was helping write the scope for the geotechnical investigations to be done uh, to help characterize the the ground uh, at the location where they were going to build this hospital um, and I then actually was on site 
supervising the works while they were completed, um, just to help check that the tests were being done uh, as we'd expect them to be completed in the locations where we needed the data, just to make sure that that was all going to be uh, usable in our design. Uh, interesting example of, of working in a different context um, was actually that the in investigations were interrupted when we found human remains in one of our trial pits. And that's a bit of a stark reminder of um, the recent history of Rwanda. In 1994, there was a genocide where 10% uh, of the population were, were killed. Um, so yeah, that was an example that really just reminds me of the recent trauma the country had been through and um, how sensitive you need to be around uh, topics like that. And also just quite an interesting uh, problem to encounter as an engineer. So also while they're, you know, not just um, delivering design and, and come up with projects, but actually trying to do some capacity building. So on all the design work we did, we'd be working with the, the local engineers um, to share knowledge and make sure we're sort of passing on any skills that we're um, from work we're, we're doing while we're there. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, you know, also benefiting from their local experience. So it's a, it's a two-way exchange. Um, Mass Design Group actually run an architecture school in Kigali called the African Design Centre. Uh, so I was, you know, lucky enough while I was there to help develop their curriculum for structural engineering and teach some classes uh, to, to this group of architects, which was quite fun too. Um, so this slide is on materials research, and this actually isn't something I did much of personally. Um, but the example here comes from James Kitchen, who is who was another EWB volunteer who, who went out the year after me. And that's him uh, in the middle here. Um, so he got involved in materials research for the use of earth construction. And the benefits of this are, are that it's a really low cost solution uh, with a tiny environmental footprints and also maximizing the use of local labor and local materials. Uh, the properties of earth construction are excellent acoustic, fire and thermal properties, and also uh, having a really interesting visual aesthetic. So the work James did was to do some durability and compressive strength tests on the round earth and compressed stabilized earth block. So, um, and they created different samples from the different soils available around the site and using different proportions um, of stabilizers such as lime and cement. Uh, and from this suite of testing, they came up uh, with a specification for the blocks, working with the contractor to develop a common understanding of, of how the material works, the construction process, um, and how, yeah, how it would be used on site. So on sustainability, I was going to talk specifically about a really interesting project called Alima Primary School uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this was a project which really was uh, carved out of the jungle, literally in the middle of nowhere. It was fantastic. Um, and it had to be done uh, that way because it was virtually impossible to get any materials to site. Anything which had to be imported came on a six hour motorbike journey down unpaved roads. So that was really very limiting. Um, so for construction materials, pretty much everything came from the site itself. So they were using laterite blocks of foundations uh, and laterite is basically a, a clay rock which they could um, quarry from the ground. They were making bricks out of clay for the walls um, and they were harvesting timber from, from the uh, jungle, which was used for the roof and finishes. Um, and this project was all done before I joined Mass, the structure was finished, but I had a task to try and assess the embodied carbon in that project. Uh, so for this, I came up with a, a well, spreadsheet. Um, I was lucky that they had really fantastic uh, records from the construction of this project. So it showed exactly 
you know, how many meters cubed of different materials had, had been imported or used, um, even down to, you know, they'd measured the liters of petrol that they'd used to uh, use chainsaws on site to, to cut down trees and, and process and shape the timber. So I had everything. Um, so I kind of interrogated all of that and came up with the spreadsheet looking at um, the carbon that was used in, in the construction. Um, so we got a number for how much embodied carbon was, was in the project and then was able to compare that to values uh, in scientific literature for um, similar values for schools in Europe or in the US. And that kind of confirmed what we expected that our, the project was had a significantly better performance in terms of embodied carbon. And we could actually quantify that, uh, that it was around 40 times better for this uh, school in the jungle. Um, and so this, this spreadsheet is now actually a tool they use in, in the organization. So you can use it to look at how successful a project, how successful a project was, and also during the design process to um, use it to try and evaluate the, the sustainability benefits of different design options. Uh, so my last example of, of something I worked on, but uh, one of my favorites. Um, so for the buildings, we have to design drainage. So uh, to do that, you think about what is the you know, most intense rainfall that we might get on this building, for example, uh, and how are we gonna get all that water away so that it doesn't flood the, the roof or the structure. Um, and if you're gonna do that in the UK, then you would go to design codes you would look up a value based on your location in the country um, and it would tell you, you know, you need to consider 100 millimetres of rain in an hour, for example. Um, so when I was in Rwanda, I received these drainage calculations uh, that had been done by a third party uh, to check them over. And I'd noticed that the value for the rainfall seemed suspiciously low. Uh, so I looked into it and turned, you know, turns out there's there's no such guidance for Rwanda um, so what the engineer had done was they'd just uh, looked up on the internet the average annual rainfall in Rwanda and then divided that by a number of hours in a year uh, to give them their rainfall intensity which was obviously um, far too low a number and was incredibly unconservative so if you'd built that it would have flooded quite regularly um, so actually what I did was um, made contact with the Rwandan Meteorological Agency and somehow persuaded them to give me 50 years worth of uh, rainfall data, raw, raw data from their gauges across the country. Got well, this huge spreadsheet or several spreadsheets. Um, and then I did a kind of statistical analysis on that um, and actually approached the University of Bristol and they found a a hydrology PhD student who who kind of checked what I was doing and confirmed it was okay and from all that data was able to produce some guidance on um, rainfall intensities for use in design uh, so that was a really fun thing to get involved in as well so this is my last slide of, of my experience in Rwanda but I had to finish with some sort of fun photos uh, this middle one at the top actually shows me visiting one of Mass's hospital projects, again, where they'd been able to use a local material in a really innovative way. Um, so they have all this volcanic rock, which is really kind of weak and basically doesn't get used for anything. But uh, in the designs they came up with, it was uh, used as a kind of stone cladding on the buildings. So it looks really nice. Um, and then I yeah, believe actually the the stone the people they trained up to work the stone in that area now are stone masons and provide this rock all over the country to kind of uh, clad buildings um but otherwise you know while i was there loads to get involved in seeing wildlife and uh hiking up volcanoes and all kinds of stuff so it was fantastic um so now i'm in the kind of final section i'm going to talk about EWB's work with the universities, uh, which is probably relevant to what some of you are going to do this year. Uh, so there are a number of chapters around the UK of EWB, uh, which are student-led groups. 
And the idea is that these provide students a space to learn how engineering can change the world, um, to discuss ideas with each other and decide what you want to do with your engineering education and careers. Uh, and I'm speaking to you today and there's, there's uh, 25 active chapters across the UK apparently. So there's a couple of different design challenges that EWB run for student groups. Um, the first one I'll admit I don't know much about. Uh, so the efficiency for access design challenge um, is a global multidisciplinary competition that empowers teams of university students to help accelerate clean energy access. And yeah, I, I haven't really been involved in this one. Uh, so all I'll say is if it sounds interesting to you, I'm sure there's uh, information on the website about it and about how you could get involved. Um, and if you can't find anything there and you still have questions, feel free to contact me. I'll share my contact details at the end of this presentation. Um, and I can do my best to, to answer any questions about that. But what I do know about and what I'm going to talk about is the Engineering for People Design Challenge. Um, and this is the award-winning uh, initiative that began back in 2011. And it's about getting groups of undergraduate engineering students to solve a real-world challenge um, using project-based learning. And over 40, well, approximately 40,000 students have participated uh, since 2011. So I have been a reviewer of the challenge um, in, uh, for this last four years since 2017. And I think it's quite relevant. I understand not everyone on this call is from University of Bristol, so I, I can't speak for all universities, but um, it might be in your curriculums already. But I, what I understand for University of Bristol is that first year students um, will be taking part in the challenge as part of their curriculum. Uh, for the first time this academic year so that's quite exciting so this could be very very relevant to a lot of you um, so the way the project works is that engineers without borders kind of write the design brief it's based on a, on a real world situation they provide all the context and the input data you need to know uh, and there are several different categories where you can develop a solution as a student group. So then the universities kind of run that um, and I'm not sure how that works. So I can't comment on how teams will be formed or how you'll decide what, what kind of problems you're working on. Um, that's all managed internally within the university. And the university, if it's part of your curriculum, also will, will give you a grade at the end of it, which will form part of your, your marks for your your year at university. However, what the university does is once they've marked all of your reports, they pick their top um, five teams from each university, I think, and they put them forward into the international competition where the engineers without borders reviewers, such as myself, then look at those to, to pick out some of the top teams from uh, around the world who've taken part. So, the teams can focus on several different problem areas uh, in the challenge. So I think this stays the same every year, but I check. so this is how it was last year, was those areas were either uh, water, sanitation, energy, waste, the built environment, which is uh, kind of my bit, uh, transport and digital. And what I'm gonna run through now is uh, the marking scheme. So this is, this is what Engineers Without Borders as an organisation are looking for from um, the reports that come in. Uh, so if you are doing the challenge this year, you know, really try and focus on trying to bring these out in your submission. Or even if you're not doing that um, design challenge, these are good things to think about in any kind of engineering project you deliver. Um, and just make sure that the work you're doing is, is as good as it can be. Um, so the first three points really are about demonstrating inclusion of the local context, whether that is social community, environmental or economic. And that is basically demonstrating that your solution 
is appropriate for the local constraints and that you've you know taken account of um, uh, what's locally available or what's best suited to the local environment. Uh, the fourth point is about demonstrating methodical assessment processes to select a preferred option by comparing design options against criteria. And that is showing that you had uh, multiple options and you've then considered what's best and that you can document and justify that process. And that's a key skill throughout any career that you'll go on to have as well. Um, for the final two I'd say are kind of similar. It's about thinking about the difficulties of implementation, um, showing, well, sim similar to the final point, which is evidence of reflection and critical thinking. And really, I think those two mean being able to identify the weaknesses of, of what's proposed. Um, you know, nothing's perfect. So show that you can see the negatives of um, what's being proposed. And but you can also suggest ways that that might be mitigated in the future or further work that might need to be done to, to resolve any weaknesses. Um, so a little bit just on this year's challenge then. So this year's uh, challenge, the, the problem was set in an area called Makers Valley, which is in Johannesburg in South Africa, um, which is this, this quite deprived area of Johannesburg with kind of lots of rundown empty warehouses and that kind of uh, area, but has a lot of vibrant um, community and quite, you know, industrial people, loads of skilled craftsmen who can work with different materials like metal and wood and glass and fabric and anything you can think of. Um, so I'll read this quote out from, from a representative of the area who says, Makers Valley is acknowledged uh, as a hub of making and brings together a community of makers and change makers focused on using their hands and their ideas to create positive change. Um, there's a fantastic 10 minute video, which I won't show now, but that's available if anyone wants to, if anyone's interested in finding out more about Makers Valley, uh, it's really good. And kind of the reason it was set in South Africa partly was that this year's challenge was run in conjunction with Engineers Without Borders South Africa, Engineers Without Borders UK and Engineers Without Borders USA. So there were teams from universities in all three countries um, taking part. And yes, yeah, so here we go. Uh, there was 8,500 students across 35 universities in five countries. So that's true. There were a few of those complex countries and I can't remember which ones. Um, and so the, uh, yes, once, once all the team's reports had been assessed, uh, I think the top eight went through into the final where they made a presentation to a judging panel. Um, and I was actually assigned as a, as a mentor to one of those teams to, to get them ready for the final. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about their solution, which I, which I liked. So they called their team uh, Wiki Tainer. And here's a, a bit from their report. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and their solution was uh, to come up with a, a website which kind of hosted, it was a platform with um, designs available um, for different ways of converting shipping containers, old shipping containers into livable space. Um, and what I really liked about the solution is for me, it really spoke to the, the context uh, and the problems in Makers Valley that had been set where, you know, there was a huge uh, wealth of, of skilled people who could, um, you know, work with different materials and, and build things. Um, but I liked that what they were proposing was was quite an easily implemented website and they were just going to host that information and kind of empower uh, local people to, to, to use that and deliver the actual work themselves, uh, which would, you know, drive local industry um, and create business rather than trying to design something and, and just build it and say, oh, here, this is what you need. So they were kind of giving people the tools to do that themselves. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's Wikitainer. They they didn't win, uh, but they made it into the final. So I was pretty happy with with what they did. Um, this is my last slide now. 
I'll we'll take some questions afterwards. But so just to kind of summarize, EWB UK is a great organization. Uh, there's loads of opportunity to apply your engineering skills in creative and impactful ways. So please do stay involved with your local chapter, uh, sign up, make sure you're getting the emails from Engineers Without Borders, which will have information on, on ways to get involved. And yeah, best of luck to anyone who gets involved with with the design challenge. That I have, I'll put my email address up. Um, if anyone wants to contact me, you know, you're very welcome to. I'll uh, I'll answer any questions anyone might have um, that you don't want to raise now. But otherwise, that is the end. So I think I'll hand back over to Gabriel, who can. Um, uh, yeah, I can I can answer any questions that might come from the audience now or so hi everyone. Uh if you want to either uh put a question in the chat if you'd rather or just unmute yourself and speak to to ask your question and then obviously the best question uh we'll send a pizza to. So if anyone's feeling brave, then welcome to your oh, oh, oh. Hello? Go ahead, Salman. Yep. Uh hello. Um I was just wondering uh well, because we have to consider these kind of things for our own design project, um, what kind of end of life considerations do you have to take into account for the projects that you build in uh, other countries? Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose that's a good question. I think a focus on thinking about the end of life of projects and their disposal you know, when I talk about this, I most talk about buildings. Um, it's something that even in the UK or uh, Europe, we've been quite slow to start thinking about that. And it's only really come in with CDM regulations, if you're aware of those. And even now, industry is probably not great at, uh, at doing it. Um, but yeah, certainly you, sh you should think of, of ways uh, of how things could be disposed of and I suppose you would apply um, I can't remember what it's called but thinking about recycling uh, like reduce reuse recycle so I suppose as far as implementing that trying to minimize the amount of waste that's going to be generated by a project in the first place I'm trying to think about how bits of it might be repurposed and finally if, if it can't actually be repurposed is it a valuable material that could be um, kind of made uh, use in some sort of other future project in a different way um but I, I mean i suppose to be honest in any kind of building project if you're using standard materials there's fairly standard ways of taking things apart at the end of it as well Thanks. Thank sounds really good uh so there's a question from uh beth and elias in the chat that i'll read out for the sake of the recording so what would you say the main mistakes people make up uh what would you say the main mistakes people make when they start a pro project are? For example, what challenges do they underestimate? Okay. Um, the, the worst mistake you can make at the start of a project is trying to solve it before you understand the problem. Um, and you might come up with something that's fantastic, but then you actually show it to the person who's going to use it at the end and they say oh actually that's you know you kind of misunderstood what I wanted so really spending time at the start of it to summarize clearly what you're trying to achieve um, and depending on what the you know if I'm doing that as a professional now I will write that out and take it back to the clients and you know make sure they agree with 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 that uh, I don't know how easily you can do that on a kind of university project but you know set it out in writing and then make sure everyone's agreed before you go too far in trying to deliver it. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, Lizzie asks, when you finish a project, how well equipped are the locals to maintain the systems you've built? Does EWB continue to provide support? Yeah, I mean, so that's a big theme within working in kind of uh, on these kind of projects is historically there was a lot done Probably, maybe I'm preaching to the choir, you'll know this, but, uh, you know, there's a lot done where you'd hand it over and then never come back and, you know, the pump breaks a year later and no one can fix it and then it just goes into disrepair and it becomes useless. And even worse, maybe people have got used to having that pump there and they've forgotten how to live without it. So you could, could have actually made the situation worse. So, yeah, there's certainly a big focus now on um, making sure that, that 
projects as implemented can be maintained and that the community have been as well that the community have been involved in actually planning the project um that they feel you know connected to it and, and a sense of ownership for it and they want to look after it um that's really important uh i would just say the way the question was asked so ewb uk themselves will not go and build a project somewhere for example where there's no schools built by ewb uk but um there are other organizations like mass who who want to do those kind of projects but they don't have any engineers to do it and they don't have the the funding or the know-how to be able to recruit one so that's where the kind of relationship is ewb in the past could provide engineers like myself um, or in other ways can provide training or guidance materials for other engineers to do that work. Uh, the next question from Ben is how do your projects relate to the UN sustainability goals? Um, so if people don't know about those, there are goals that EWB as a whole try to fill. Um, and they started, I think in 2000, um, around social and environmental factors mainly. Yeah. Um, yeah, they certainly should. Uh, I guess what I would say, which is kind of me avoiding the question, but by the time you get to the engineer who's designing how, you know, I think most of those sustainability goals are met by deciding to do a project or not. And it's the, the person who decides, um, you know, yes, we're going to invest and build a maternity waiting village, or yes, we're going to invest and improve the water supply in this area who can have the most impact on on meeting those goals which are you know they're all quite high level um but you know the, the way you deal with that as an engineer is if you have an awareness of how to make a you know maximize the sustainability of a project at an engineering level the choice of materials and um you know choice of uh mechanical equipment and that kind of stuff um you can still have an impact so yeah certainly considered uh, and Harry asks, from your experience in developing countries, what would you say the most pressing civil engineering project is required in the future, especially post-COVID? Oh, wow. So quite a big question. Yeah, that was quite a big question. I'm, you know, I'm also conscious I don't really want to uh, just answer all these myself. So if, if anyone kind of feels like they have something to say, feel free to jump in. There's some, um, there's some really good points here, actually. Um, I, I think in the future, maybe we should, we should host a sort of panel event. Um, we could we could do something like that and talk about some of these wider themes. Um, obviously, working on individual projects, you don't necessarily see the the larger picture, but uh, there's definitely work to be done and decisions to be made in the future. Mm -hmm. So I will. I have avoided that question though. So it it was uh, what's the most pressing civil engineering challenge? Um, I mean, I I guess something on my mind is. Um, and actually I'm probably maybe answering this from my perspective now as an engineer working in the UK on projects in the UK um, you know yeah this is the sustainability and the energy usage in, in of materials in construction uh, it's one of the ma um, yeah, major contributors to, to energy emissions in, in the UK is construction um, and so making sure uh, that those are those projects are done well, um, maximizing sustainability, making sure as well that they're delivered in a way that the energy usage during the life cycle of the project of the building, you know, heating a building, um, all of its mechanical and electrical systems are as effective and efficient as possible. Um, so Joda asks, as an engineer working on projects such as the ones you've pre presented, do you ever have problems working with the community and managing community relations? Um, I suppose, how do you do that as well? Yeah. Um, so I, again, I suppose I'd say, um, my role uh, was probably generally quite limited in terms of interaction I'd have with, uh, local population or where I did it was also through an intermediary um, 
so actually maybe I'll go to the, the example that springs to mind was the 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 human remains we found in that uh, geotechnical investigation so for that um you know I was out uh, working in the field this was publicly owned land actually so we had um well the local local leader of that kind of part of part of the town was with us and he'd you know we made sure he was really bought into the project he wanted to see this hospital project happen so um you know there was a lot of people kind of watching what we were doing what these guys doing in our in our area um but by having that leader on side he was able to kind of deflect any questions and persuade uh our people show them the benefits of what this project was going to achieve so yeah making sure you um have the support of influential people in in the area and i guess i, I should add you know winning their support by making sure you're delivering what they want not just uh, convincing them that you know what they want uh, Dom asks a very good question. He he says, uh, what would you say the most useful engineering skill you developed in your time working on these projects abroad was? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, I feel like I worked on a huge variety of stuff uh, in kind of just what I mentioned. I mean, I was only there for, for under four months. Um, so I was really privileged in, in the different things I was able to get involved with. Um, what did I learn the most from that? I guess probably, you know, the most relevant lesson to take away that's transferable to other projects is making sure you understand what are the limitations of what can be done on site before you do your design. So, you know, what materials are actually available um, before you design something that then can't be built. Uh, so there's a few broader questions about EWB here. So, um whether or not we work with the UN human rights, is it, no, uh, refugees, I think it is, the High Commissioner for Refugees to provide refugees with uh, intermediate technology. Uh, that's, I suppose, broader, but are you able to answer that, uh, James? Not, not really. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not, there are staff, engineers, upward of staff who can answer those kind of questions. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm I just uh, in, you know, uh, work in private practice and volunteer some time to engineers without borders what i would say i'm aware there's there is a guy who's also involved he's actually on the the board of engineers without borders on the board of engineers without borders. Uh, and he is involved in a project trying to develop this um uh, manually powered washing machine um and the idea is to roll that out to refugee camps, for example, as a kind of low tech solution for, for washing clothes. Um, so I know he is he's associated with engineers about borders and, and doing those kind of projects. Uh, yeah, if you if you give me the contact after this. I, um, oh, he'd I'll, love to speak to you as well. Yeah, do uh, remind me for that afterwards. Maybe we could organize a spotlight lecture or <laughs> something else. Who knows? Maybe something for he's, our engineers he'd, podcast. He'd love to speak to you. Uh, Bethan asks quite a good question, which I suppose we should be able to answer but maybe we, we don't uh i can try gabriel you? okay great so i'll read it out okay. so other than the ewb website are there any other rec uh, resources you would recommend for research over to you beth you're taking that one beth i think I if, if we mind. lost her uh, oh she's back you out with the washing oh no can you hear me hello yeah, yeah we can we can now yeah. video can you hear me? Okay, I turned off my video. I was just saying that I actually met the guy you're talking about with the washing machine. Oh, yeah. Um, Nav. He's a cool guy. Yeah, that was his name. Nav. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was going to try and answer Bethan's question um, because I've done some, I've been attempting to job search in this kind of area recently. And the IKEA Foundation is a really cool um, site you should probably check out. And also Save the Children. Some of the lecturers at the University of Bristol work with them to um, like try and earthquake proof schools in Nepal and other really cool projects. Um, that's more civil engineering because that's what I am. Um, and also um, Oxfam also take on projects and things as well. Um, I actually wanted to ask you a question, James, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, and it was if, you know, someone like any of us students wanted to kind of have a career path that looks as cool as yours, 
uh, what kind of advice would you give on how to get involved really yeah I mean I'm a bit of a fraud you know I, I, I've done a few months of this but otherwise I just I designed um, power stations and ports and stuff in the UK so I'm, I'm actually not the best example uh, um, I mean what what I yeah so as I said at the moment the international placement scheme has got stopped with the EWB but I you know personally I'm, I'd love to see it come back um, in, in one form or another uh, and I you know that's kind of the route that got me into this and hopefully it's a route that will be back in the, in the future to get some of you into it so I think it's important if anyone wants to see that that you do try and get engaged in discussions with EWB and kind of um, you know show the excitement for, for these kind of opportunities um, other routes I don't know to be honest I That's think it's, right. it's pretty it's pretty competitive it's difficult uh, also but yeah I mean uh, yeah there should I mean that's maybe that's one way is is there should be some sort of uh, discussion board within EWB where they have a list of organizations that you can get involved with um, so if that doesn't exist you could post that question on an EWB forum and get some uh, get some answers Thanks, it's good but you know I'm aware of mass for example are one of a number of organizations that I'm aware EWB have worked with in the past um, so you know uh, well you're looking at civil engineering aren't you so uh, I can I can list some civil engineering companies but these, these are all quite small you know and they have occasional needs for an engineer but they're not recruiting tens of them brilliant so i think we'll take our last question uh seeing as it's gone seven o'clock uh so final one's from dom and he asks how important is training local students in engineering uh in order to achieve sustainable development in the long term so i guess training of people yeah where construction takes takes place extremely important yeah you know there's um and I, you know, they, so when I was in mass, they had about a 50-50 split between Western engineers and Rwandan engineers. Um, and, you know, these, these Rwandan, you know, they're, they're universities where these guys have learned civil engineering in Rwanda. And, you know, so they're, they're quite capable. Um, but it was just bringing them a bit more supervision, a bit more focus on things like quality assurance, checking of, of calculations, which may be sometimes slip through the net when um, a business isn't quite as developed in their kind of processes um, but yeah yeah really really important there's no point in me turning up and designing something for three months then leaving because um, it won't happen again after that so in that same way so trying to implement things that will be able to be self-sustaining after you've gone um, but yeah very brilliant uh, well thanks for having us uh, thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us uh, for an excellent talk. I suppose it comes down to pick uh, somebody to get a pizza. I think we should go oh, for two I didn't people, actually. Oh, yeah. Sorry, am I, were you about to say me? I, I was, didn't uh, to choose. Well, no. I've, I've been re reading okay, out the you, chat, so yeah, it's kind of hard. I, don't want uh, to, you, I think we should choose. go for two, actually, because we've had a lot of good questions. Uh, I think we should say Bethan should have a pizza, because great question there. And also Dom, because he asked a couple of good questions there. Uh, so we'll email you shortly. Uh, Bethan, got to get your surname. Yeah, all right, cool. And then uh, hopefully you'll receive some emails from us in the future. Come to our next events. Our next Spotlight Lecture Series uh, lecture is in two weeks' time. Uh, there's also being run by our previous president, uh, Jade. She's running an event next Thursday on inspiring female engineers. Uh, it's online and it's on our Facebook page if you want to find out more. We have a Discord, Discord, so you can join that if you'd like. Uh, and if you're not already signed up to the newsletter, then that's the best place to hear about what's happening. Uh, buy a fleece too, because they look great and they're recycled. And, you know, everyone will think, wow, that person, they're in the best engineering society. So thanks everyone for joining us. And I think we'll end it there. Okay. Bye. Thanks, thanks for hosting.